Okay, we're live. Hey everybody, welcome to number one of Ask Star Baby, a new series for the 10% Truth podcast. Star Baby, nice to see you. Glad you turned up. How you doing? It's nice to be here. Hey, I'm... Welcome to number one of Ask Star Baby, a new series for the 10% Oh, Truth hold on. Podcast. Okay, that's weird. I can hear myself. Star Baby. Nice to see you. Yeah, Glad I can hear myself. Up. How you doing? It's nice to be here. Hey, I'm... Welcome to number one of Ask all right. Can you still hear me? Okay. <laughs> hey, anybody listening at home uh, or uh, at work on a sneaky earphone, um, thank you very much for that uh, little tip. If you can't hear us or if the sound is bad or if anything's going on that's that's not right, leave a comment and... Uh, we will respond to that, or I'll respond to that. Sedlow said music's off, but I don't know. We weren't playing any music, so I don't know what that means. Sedlow, speak in plain English. Tell us what's going on. Um, hey, everybody, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. I, I was saying to Star Baby before we went live here, um, and he was saying the same to me, which is interesting, that there are a few things like this that we do that are, are quite exciting that we look forward to doing, and this is definitely one of them. And so I'm a little anxious. I hope that this proves to be successful that you uh, all enjoy it that importantly star baby enjoys it because i want him to come back and do this every month um and so give us your feedback tell us what you think um this is the first time we've done this so the format's new uh, i'd said trying to get to 90 minutes as a limit so it doesn't go over everyone laughed at me when i said that and uh, star baby said he thought it was cute that i was assigning time blocks to each phase of this conversation we'll see how we go that's pretty much all we can say about that. But hey, before we start, I wanted to just do a shout out to a few people. So I increasingly find myself when I talk about 10% true, instead of using I, uh, I use we. And that's because um, even though it's a small, tiny, modest podcast that's, as you know, doesn't make any money and isn't a commercial venture, there is a team of people who is working or are working rather behind the scenes to help make things work. And so on the Discord side, which is really the main interface between me and um, most of the audience, and indeed Starbaby and most of the audience, um, we've got Scotty, who's effectively the chief technology officer at 10% True. He's running that for us. He set it up for us. Um, he makes it work. So, Scotty, thanks for doing that. He is also, incidentally, going to be looking at the chat today, I hope, and taking questions from you um, and putting them into a Word document. And at various points during the course of this conversation, I will stop and I'll, I'll ask, I'll go to that Word document and I'll ask Starbaby to answer your live questions. It just means I don't have to look away from him and not really listen to what he's saying while you're asking your questions. So uh, that's uh, Scotty. And then there's also Sedlow, who I just mentioned, and Jim as well. And they, even though there isn't really much moderation to do on the Discord uh, server, we're all very mature individuals um, and we tend to keep away... <laughs> Okay, most of us are mature individuals. We tend to tend to keep away from um, sort of sensitive topics that might be um, sort of fiery. Uh, they're there to moderate and they help as well. Jax, now he is the man. I say the man. He might actually be a, a, a girl as well. I don't know. He's he's changed his username to Jax, um, the Raptor guy slash girl. So I won't be presumptuous and say I, I know what gender he is. But Jax, thank you for doing this background. Um, he is our chief memes officer. And if you go to the Discord channel, you'll see there's a, a memes um, section where he posts his stuff and other people can do the same. So thank you um, to Jax for that. Also, <laughs> there's a limit to uh, technology. I want you to stay. I'll take that back. Um, so thank you, Jax, for doing that. And, and also, people have been badgering me for a while about doing merch. Uh, that's not really my thing because, I, again, I, you know, I'm trying to do this for fun. I don't want it to turn into some kind of commercial venture where it feels like hard work because as soon as that happens, I'll stop doing it. But I am working with Sci-Fi Concepts. That's his name, his username, um, maybe even his, his company, I, I don't know, in South Africa. He's come up with some great designs for a T-shirt. And he's working um, in South Africa to get, try and get some screen printing done so, and get some pricing for that. So there's a bunch of people behind the scenes that are doing things. But then also, really importantly, there are the people that donate to me um, and to, to the channel. It is expensive doing this, actually, uh, probably more than a £1,000 a year uh, on software, subscription, and, and so on and so forth. And then 
there are, are the sort of costs in, in time and not spending time with family and those sorts of things, which is fine. I, I take that all on. That's, that's my responsibility. I enjoy doing this. That's why I do it. But when you donate, it really makes a difference. It helps me pay for those things, and um, I appreciate it greatly. So um, on that note, this isn't a political broadcast, so I won't go into the details, but I don't use PayPal anymore. I now use a company called Buy Me A Coffee. It's the same principle. You can go, if you wanted to make a donation to the channel, you're not actually buying me a coffee. You're sending me some money. Um, but you can go to the link that's in the description of all the videos and will be in the description here, which is called Buy Me A Coffee, and you can make a small donation if, if you want to. But, but again, this isn't about asking you for your money because this is supposed to be free. So, And then finally, really quickly, because I realize we're five minutes in, Star Baby hasn't really talked much yet. Um, I wanted to just let you know of some of the things that are coming on the channel. So we've got um, booked in um, an interview with Fifi and... Um, Star Baby mentioned her in previous episodes. I'm hoping to speak to her in November. She was the first female Strike Eagle uh, squadron commander as well as also the first female Thunderbird pilot. And she's, um, I've only had limited interactions with her, but everybody I know who knows her has said she's a fantastic individual. So I'm really excited about doing that interview with her. I have already recorded an F-16CJ interview with Flash. That will be coming out in probably about two weeks' time. Um, and also... Because, so Star Baby is keeping me honest on this, I said I'd do it, so in December, and I'll circulate a date on the Discord channel uh, later on this weekend, I will do the Star Wars reenactment thing, uh, so that you uh, can come along and, and voice some of the actors, and Star Baby can coach you through how it would be done in proper 3-1 com. Oh, and finally, just as a reminder, we are going to do the Wild Weasel AMA in January. So that's in Star Baby's diary. It's in my diary to do in January. So we haven't forgotten about that. It's coming. Right. So the format of this conversation then, and I won't repeat this next time we do it, just the first time. Um, I'm going to ask Star Baby to tell me a story. He's always given me grief about the fact there's not enough 10% true on 10% true. So I'm going to ask him to give me a story. Second part is we're going to talk uh, through, or, or Star Baby's going to give us a canned update on what he's seeing around the, Korea, the Ukraine conflict um, since our last conversation, which was about a month ago. And I know he's got some material prepared for that, which is great because if he shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know, it would be um, a little disappointing. And then we're going to use the Discord channel questions that have already been posed for him about Ukraine to ask him what he thinks um, uh, about the questions that, that, that the people on the Discord uh, channel have asked. We have a, a short interlude that will allow him to take a little bit of a, a, a break, sort of a, a minute, two minutes, something like that. Uh, and then I'm going to cover two news topics that have happened in the last month or so and just get his thoughts on those. And, and if anybody's keen to know what that is, that's going to be, first of all, Dave Deptula's latest policy paper from the Mitchell Institute, where he talks about effectively the US Air Force having the smallest, weakest Air Force in history, and the current budget proposal um, only adding to that or making that worse. And then Red Six, which is this uh, augmented reality um, organization business that's now teaming with Boeing to bring augmented reality training to F-15EX and, and the T-7. So we'll talk about that. And then finally, we'll end with some general questions. So I've done my talking. I'm going to have a sip of water or something. So Star Baby, while I'm doing that, why don't you tell us a story? Star Baby, let me stop you. Let me stop you. I we got someone saying no one can hear us. So it says Star Baby mic is not working. Okay, give us a sec. I can hear you, yeah. So I wonder. Have you got um Right. Um say something, Star Baby, give us a mic check. Something, Star Baby, because of mic check. Okay, someone in the comments. It's going to take a few seconds to filter through. Tell us. It says you can hear him, but very low volume. Okay. All right. Is it better now? I don't know. I need to say something before he knows if it's better now. Spectre Pilot <laughs> says this is the best episode yet. Yeah, okay. So I know that guy. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> all right loud and clear we're good to go all right so go back to stop every sorry everybody about that uh, go back to what you were saying first of all about jack's um meme in the background because i don't think anyone would have heard that I, I maybe okay i'll redo it. everything redo all right everything. so jack's thanks for the imagery next time you do it make me look a little bit thinner okay so that would be cool all right, number two, Fifi, great aviator, flew with her when she was a first lieutenant. She did captain things. I mean, she literally would do things in the aircraft that it would take years for an Iwo Wizzo to train a pilot to do adequately. So she was phenomenal. Uh, also a great person and a you know totally excellent individual all around. And now I'll tell a story. So 561st, the last great fighter squadron, which it said on our T-shirts, at Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada in the 90s. And we were the only operational squadron on the base. We had the Thunderbirds, we had the weapon school. So despite the fact that we're the ops guys, right? We're the guys who are regularly logging combat sorties. We're the last on priority for a bunch of things. And one of the things we got to do, which could be good, could be bad, is we got to support the weapon school as Red Air. And so there I was, weapon school sortie, and we're supporting an F-15 guy and the previous day had not gone well. He'd busted the ride. And apparently the story was, I wasn't there, but the weasels, he totally lost control, not only of the ride, but the debrief where they just walked all over him, you know? And uh, it, it was not good. So he's having to redo the ride and we fly the ride and we get to the debrief and he's very directive. And I had flown with Mark Sveska up front. You know, he's the flight lead. I'm in the back of the lead airplane. It was a 4v4 kind of uh, intercepts to possibly dissimilar air combat. I don't actually remember the details. Uh, and I can't remember Mark's call sign. Or, I mean, his personal call sign is Pug. But what he, I don't remember what he flew under, so I'm going to assume that it was Keystone, which is one of our beer call signs. So the, the weapons school student decides he's going to assume control of the debrief, and he says, okay, this is the way it's going to go. Nobody here is going to speak. I'm going to ask you yes or no questions, and you are going to reply yes or no. Does everybody understand? And we go, yes. Okay? And he asks the first question. He starts to draw up on the board. He turns to me, and he says, Keystone One, are you the East Man or the West Man? And I say, yes. And Mark just <laughs> looks across the briefing room at me, and I'm going to say it, but he just he just moved his lips in the pattern. He said, you are such an asshole and that is a story that mark tells you know when he wants to tell a star baby story and the reality is we got a laugh around the room it kind of lightened the tone and the debrief went fine and the guy passed the roll the passed the ride but i'm totally you know on board with the whole outcome <laughs> of the opening you know i have been both the east man and the west man simultaneously because i had no other options we were talking um, before we went live and you were muted. I did say your mum has a lot to answer for. Mrs. Petruca, thank you for joining us, by the way, if you are. We, we, we appreciate your viewing. <laughs> Tell us about Ukraine, then. What's what's going on? What are you seeing? Okay. Um, so, a bunch of developments in the, the last week. And I'm, of course, going to focus on the air power as I get uh, into it in a second. But the big picture is the Russians have lost the initiative uh, at the strategic level and certainly at the operational level and in most areas at the tactical level. It doesn't mean they're not dangerous, but it means that the Russians are in a position where they have to react to Ukrainian moves. On the air power front, the Ukrainians are flying suppression of enemy air defenses sorties every day and Literally, almost every day, they claim that they have killed another S-300 complex, which is the SA-10, SA-20 uh, kind of SAM system. Their claims, if you add them up, have now ended up accounting for pretty much every SA-10 battery the Russians have ever built um, <laughs> for non-export purposes, and we know that's not true. Uh, Oryx Group, which actually uh, runs a, does a... a uh, there are a bunch of guys in the Netherlands who do battle damage analysis based on video and pictures. And their rule is, if you don't have pictures, it didn't happen. And they can account for two launchers. Um, so there's pretty much uh, a high probability that the Ukrainians are killing uh, S-300 type SAM systems. But 
Uh, they are definitely suppressing them, but their claims are excessive. There have been some Russian air defense activity. They did earlier this week bag an Su-24, an Ukrainian Su-24, a swing-wing uh, low-level attack bomber. I have no word on the crew. I haven't seen anything come out, and obviously I hope that uh, uh, they ejected successfully and were recovered. And the Ukrainians lost a MiG-29 just a couple days ago, apparently to a collision. Mm -hmm. So the pilot was going after the Garan-2 drones, which are uh, remarked Iranian Shahed 136. They're called kamikaze drones. They're essentially low-cost GPS-guided cruise missile-like things. Good only for hitting fixed targets. And in this case, because the Russians are shooting them, that means civilian targets. Uh, and the pilot of the MiG-29 bagged a number of these things uh, along with one or two cruise missiles. The count isn't clear, but apparently the aircraft was lost in a collision, um, which which suspects, if the story goes, that he was on his fifth, he was, he was looking at the fifth drone, so I suspect he might have been out of usable missiles and gone in with a gun and possibly not been able to avoid it. In any case, he ejected successfully uh, and maybe a case on depending on how you do your kills maybe the mig 29's first ace i'm pretty confident that the ukrainians have the mig 29's first aces they're just not advertising it so the air picture is still dangerous for both sides um and as dangerous as it is for ukrainians it's more dangerous for russians uh the number of air defense systems up in the front is pretty dense on the ukrainian side the operators are pretty good uh they have they're, they've got a pretty good success rate against cruise missiles, both the military ones and the, the Shaheds, uh, normally exceeding 50% on any given night. And they're using everything down to man portable shoulder launched kind of systems, uh, which is good. I mean, they're, they're doing good work, and I expect things will get better as more NATO provided systems trickle in the country. The Russian air power uh, consists of. Su-25 sorties, so close air support sorties on the front, and they've lost another three or four of those aircraft in the past two weeks. Um, there is a report yesterday that, ah, I really wish I could confirm, that air defense has shot down a four-ship of Ka-52 attack helicopters in 18 minutes. I, I've seen that from several sources. It could be circular reporting. I have seen no video, but if true, it's spectacular. Um, and the Russians continue to use bombers to launch air launch cruise missiles from well outside threat range to hit various targets. So that's kind of the big picture, air picture standpoint. One of the, the obvious questions is over the past three or four nights, there have been barrages of barrages of missiles. And those have consisted of a couple ballistic missiles a number of air launch cruise missiles, and then the Shahid-136 drones uh, and 131s. These are Delta Wing drones with about a 20 kilogram, you know, 40 something pound warhead in them that are GPS guided and can go hit a point on the land that they're programmed to hit. Most of those are launched out of Crimea, but some have apparently been launched out of Belarus uh, in order to hit targets, and they are all aimed at civilian targets. They're hitting power plants. They have tried to hit dams. They tried to hit a glass bridge, glass pedestrian bridge in Kyiv. They did, by the way. They did hit it, and it didn't come down, hmm. which tells you the big difference in bridge construction is the Russians can have a steel and concrete bridge going across from Crimea to Russia, and one explosion drops a span and takes a bunch of things down, drops several spans, actually. And yet the Russians attack a glass bridge in Kyiv, <laughs> and it's still there. And in fact, a guy posted a video the next day of him up on the glass bridge playing a guitar. Naturally, he's by himself, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's there. So we have an air bombardment going on because that's the only tool that the Russians have to reach beyond the front line. And they are trying an air power technique that has never, ever worked. And that is a terror bombing campaign. Hmm. It didn't work against the British. It didn't work against the Germans. It didn't work against the Japanese. Uh, it has never worked against anybody. And the Russians are going to give it a go because the Russian strategic way of war, which I'll probably mention later, uh, involves a long stream of pointless brutality. So civilian casualties 
in Ukraine are continuing to be generated um, in a number of cities because the Russians are using air assets to deliberately target uh, civilian objects on the ground. Uh, and that includes uh, some pretty heinous targeting, including one uh, playground that was blown up, big big crater uh, in the middle of a residential complex that was fortunately an empty playground at the time. But that's the way the Russians are actually targeting their air power. There's a lot of aspects of that that are bad, for, in even a Russian standpoint, militarily, because all those shots against civilian targets mean that there's a military effect somewhere that, that they can't have because they've wasted their ammo uh, against a target that is not in any way going to affect the battlefield calculus. And it's certainly not going to affect the decision making of the Ukrainian government, except to make them angrier. And the Russians have a limited number of their expensive air-launched and sea-launched cruise missiles, and they cannot really produce more. Even when they can get the parts, uh, production rates are fairly low in a couple of missiles a month. Now that Western sanctions have deprived them a lot of the dual-use components that they would otherwise use, it's an open question whether the Russians can rebuild any land attack cruise missiles in which case they're shooting them for limited value. So big picture, the there's a long, hard war ahead. There's a lot of heroism going on on the battlefield, just like there always is. This is a hard, nasty, grinding war, uh, like many a war. And, but things are looking up for Ukraine and backed by NATO, I have good expectations of an eventual victory but it's not going to come soon, and it's not going to come easy. We're, we're going to start to uh, go through the questions that were on Discord, and then I'll, I'll check while you're doing that, start maybe whether or not Scotty's been able to dump any questions into the live. He has, actually. There's one in there. Okay, so I see it. It's working. Okay. So anybody listening at home, you're welcome to ask questions about around Ukraine or actually any other military or aerospace topic if you want. Um, we're obviously time limited, so we won't be able to get through everything, but you can do that now if you'd like to, uh, and we'll go through the questions. So, but, but before we do that, so a couple of, couple of things from me then, Star Baby. What do you know of the order of battle for the Ukrainian Air Force? Do you know... Uh, do you have a sense or a reliable set of sources for how many aeroplanes they have left? Um, Su-24s, uh, Su-25s, MiG-29s, uh, Su-27s. Those are the four uh, biggies for them, I suppose. Um, where are they at with that? Have they got enough resources to carry on waging some kind of air campaign? Yes, they have enough resources. If I were to – I haven't done a count. The way I would do a count is I would look at the pre-war order of battle and I'd go to scramble.nl. Um, for that to get a good, because they're pretty, I don't want to say anal, but they're pretty anal about their orders of battle, particularly in Europe, because they're a bunch of Dutch plane spotters, and that's what they do. And then I would take a look at the Oryx group, and I'd subtract the losses. Now, that's not going to give you a perfect number, because what I've heard is that the Ukrainians have been pulling aircraft out of storage depots. And remember, Ukraine has an aviation industry, and a pretty capable aviation industry, so I don't know whether they're putting airframes back into service or using them for spare parts, but it's entirely possible they're putting airframes back into service. Plus, we had several pledges to supply MiG-29s to Ukraine, and those pledges were made, and then everybody stopped discussing when they would arrive and where they would go. So I honestly don't know if they've made it. So that's why counting the airframes is, is pretty hard to do. But clearly from an air defense standpoint and the fact that they are successfully intercepting inbound missile shots with aircraft uh, and the fact that, that uh, Ukrainian soldiers do see their own fixed wing and rotary wing close air support because we they tend to take cell phone videos and post them, uh, there's still a functional, capable fighting force, just not a really big one. Hmm. Well, on that note, I was also going to ask, but you've prompted the question anyway so for example with the four ship ka-52 claim and the various other claims that have been going around it is noteworthy to me that earlier in the campaign that there was lots of footage of stuff happening let's say and uh, recently as the ukrainians have captured more territory they've come across the crash sites of su-35s 
um, you know, Sue Thirty Fours, that kind of thing. But there's a, an absence of of video documentary around the latest kills. Um, is there anything you can read into that? Are these busy, these people just busy fighting, and the earlier videos came from civilians? Um, is there a campaign deliberately on the Ukrainian part to deny that sort of intelligence to the enemy? Um, what, what do you make of it? We know that the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense has, I don't want to say cracked down, but they've kind of closed down a lot of the paths where the video would be sent. It's particularly in the south, around uh, in the southern offensive in Kherson province. They have been pretty good at maintaining uh, operational security. And so what the, what the Ukrainians really post are liberation videos, where you raise the Ukrainian flag over a liberated town, those are very popular and we see a lot of those and we see a lot of small unit engagements and I still see SAM shots uh, every now and then come in. But all of those are relatively short range engagements where the cameraman can see the target. So in cases uh, where the cameraman can't see the target uh, or the target is the edge, I mean, there's some I just can't assess because with a cell phone camera, there's a guy somewhere near a ridge line, several miles away, and I see the smoke trail go and I see an explosion. But what actually happened, I can't tell. Um, as the Ukrainians get more capable systems and can engage targets beyond visual range, you'll see less video because all there is to film is the missile launch. So it's a combination, I think, of all of these things is guys are busy uh, that the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense is trying to uh, avoid giving good information to the Russians. And I think engagements are happening at longer and longer ranges. Okay, let's, let's move to some of the questions from the Discord channel. And so uh, Sci-Fi Concepts asked, and this is interesting because you kind of referenced it a minute ago around systems coming from NATO countries, but does Ukraine have enough air defense systems? Okay, so now I have to run this. A question. Since before your sun burned hot in space and before your race was born, I have awaited a question. Okay, so it's particularly appropriate the first question came from Sci-Fi Concepts, and I hope everybody could hear that. Um, no, the answer is no, because you never have enough air defense systems. Ukraine's big, and because it is basically surrounded by enemies on two and a half sides, uh, and in fact, three sides, because sea-launched cruise missiles have been coming out of the western edge of the Black Sea and overflying Moldovan airspace. So essentially it's a surround environment and any city in Ukraine is subject to being hit. They don't have enough air defense systems, but they are never going to have enough air defense systems to cover every place you're going to need to cover. So they're getting more. And this is the most amazing hodgepodge of air defense systems that will ever be assembled. Uh, old Russian systems, European systems, American systems, uh, systems that the Ukrainians have reworked. It's going to take some real talent to put all this together. But they don't have enough, but their density is increasing. And what I would like to see the U.S. supply is CRAM, which stands for counter rocket and mortar, which we used in Afghanistan and Iraq to handle incoming rockets. They're gun based systems, and uh, the U.S. CRAM is based on the Army's Vulcan Phalanx point defense system, which was designed for ships. They are a 20 millimeter cannon. I have seen them in use uh, in Baghdad to down rockets and they're owned by the US Army. And I don't know what our storage capacity is, but those are things that have potential because they were designed to shoot down anti-ship missiles. They're not gonna cover a huge area, but they may add to the ability to defend cities or compact high value areas with a gun based air defense that just can go from engagement to engagement to engagement using 20, mil 20 millimeter rounds, which are easy to supply. One of the things that strikes me about the contribution that uh, Western nations are, are making to Ukraine militarily is the wide variation in, in, in types and, and complexity of the different systems that they're getting. And I was reading this week that I think French are going to provide Kratal. The Spanish have said they're going to send Hawk. Uh, the British have already sent Starstreak. Um, 
uh, um, Nassim's, I think, is the other one that's sort of ground based. Nathan, um, yeah. Nathan is ground based. Iris T as well. Iris T is there. I, I remember you talking in the one of the Wild Weasel interviews about the a Russian system that had a sort of uh, an idiot button. I don't remember exactly what you called it, where you'd just press a button and it would just do everything it needed to do for you. These systems, are they complicated? Are they easy to learn? Uh, is it going to stretch the um, Ukrainians from a sort of knowledge management onboarding? you know, sort of enablement point of view to have all these different things coming in? Well, so from a grand training standpoint, the answer is yes. But from an individual standpoint, you're not going to train one guy to work six systems. You're going to train one guy or gal to work one system. And so those training programs exist. There's the language aspect, but the ability to train Ukrainians to work the system and work it effectively is essentially resident resident within NATO, particularly if, if you can uh, take Ukrainians out of the country and take them to Spain for Hawk training or Britain for other missile training, uh, Germany, whatever. Um, they're designed, they're much easier to use than they used to be. Even the Hawk, which is an old system and a Hawk rewarded talent. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's still in use. The Spanish Hawks are like the Block 4, or what we might call PIP 4, uh, Product Improvement Program 4. They're the the most modernized of the Hawk systems ever. And so I expect them to, to have a bunch of computer assistants that they didn't originally have. The interesting part about all of this is going to be how do they integrate into a system. But I think all the European SAM, in fact, I'm fairly confident, that most European SAMs are designed to integrate with a European air defense network using existing NATO standards uh, and standardization agreements. So once you put all the pieces together, you may be able to get these guys to talk to each other. Um, and I saw a video of an SA-8 and OZA, and that's the SAM system with the easy button, uh, that was also using an additional bolt-on data link fed tablet display to help feed it an air picture independent of its radar. So uh, what I've learned over the last eight months is you can't count the Ukrainians as out or behind the power curve just because they've never seen something before. Yeah. Uh, it seems to be working pretty well for them. Okay, let's take another question. We'll, we'll take one from the live audience now then. So uh, let's go to a name I don't recognize. Brian McManus. That's how I'm going to select these are the names I don't recognize. Brian McManus has asked, uh, do Ukrainian and Russian pilots tend to use the same tactics? And if they do, what does that mean in the air? If they don't, again, what does that mean in the air? Okay, so they would have 20 years ago. Uh, now you see a, a difference in tactics. So the Russians are still using Soviet tactics, uh, much to my surprise, but that's the way it is. Uh, they're still using them and they're still dealing with some of the inflexibility that's involved with dealing with ex-Soviet tactics. The Ukrainians um, are developing their own, but they had already been exercising with US and NATO forces before the latest stage of the invasion. So Ukraine's Air Force had been moving towards Western tactics and getting direct exposure to those for a number of years before the latest stage of the conflict. I, I remind everybody that the Russo-Ukrainian War started in 2014 and not in February of this year. So the impact of that is that the the Ukrainians are now equipped with with a, a a toolkit, you know, a mental toolkit of things they can do that fits in well with both how they prefer to fight and how they've been forced to fight, which is small groups operating without intense command and control and doing what needs to be done and then moving on. Whereas the Russians have a much more uh, centrally controlled structure even now. The other aspect, and this is huge, is that a lot of the highly experienced Russian test pilots and pilots that we are aware of that we saw at air show demos and that were used to sell their aircraft, those guys were downed early and taken out of the picture one way or another. Okay, next question. 
so uh, Sedlow's asking how is the how would the introduction of NASM's and Hawks help with the cruise missile and Iranian drone strikes? We talked about this a little on Discord, um, where I said, "Well, I wonder if Patriot will come along." And you were like, "You don't want to don't want to use Patriot against this threat. You want to use something else." So is that is that um, yeah? So are NASM's and and Hawk going to help with that? So certainly NASAMS is going to eat cruise missile waves for lunch if they existed, because each of those missiles at close range, uh, particularly if you're using AMRAM, or it doesn't matter if you're using Sidewinder in an NASAMS, these are all fire and forget. Um, and so the missile acquires its target coming out of the, the box, and it doesn't take up a radar channel to do that. It doesn't have, rely on the radar for guidance. It's got its own little radar in the case of the AMRAM or its IR seeker in the ca- case of the Sidewinder. So you can go shoot, 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 and you've just engaged six targets with six independent systems. The Shahed drones, which the Ukrainians call mopeds because of their 50cc moped engine, they sound like it. It's unique. You can search for it on Twitter and hear it if anybody really feels the need to hear a flying moped. Uh, those are are easy targets from an air fe- speed standpoint, but they're small targets that you're going to use a SAM on if you need to hit it. Uh, but those are the things I would not ex- I would expect Hawk to have a hard time with those just because of the long reaction time. I still think a Hawk will do reasonably well against a cruise missile because a cruise missile is just a small jet aircraft flying in a predictable manner. Don't, don't the Russians have, I don't know if the KH-101 is one of them, but don't they have sort of stealthy, in inverted commas, cruise missiles that will reduce reaction time for something like a Hawk? Well, so it depends on what's feeding the Hawk. So the old radar, the, the Hawk's pulse acquisition radar, which operated in Delta Band for NATO EW bands, that's, you know, between, call it 1,000 and 2,000 megahertz. That is in a band that is going to be very resistant to small aircraft stealth. Um, so you can make it radar low observability as, as, as nice as you like. But when you've got a small airframe, if you have a long wavelength that kind of encompasses the airframe, you still get some backscatter. And so the old PAR is going to be pretty good counter stealth. And the, the illumination radar for the Hawk... Well, each Hawk battery has two what are called hippers, which are high power illumination radars. And if you make a handoff to a hipper, a hipper is almost high enough powered to melt your paint. Um, it is not going to be concerned because it's all the stealth, the effect of stealth and the effect of low radar cross section is in the radar range equation. And once you get to inside 20 miles where the Hawk is designed to operate and somebody lights you up with a hipper, the power part of that range equation is essentially going to overpower the small radar cross section part of your radar range equation. Um, so it'll work well enough. Question from Discord. I like this one. Uh, Linux Lear had asked how long until Russia will have to throw in their Su 57 <laughs> Femboy into the war? And uh, Linux Lear, I don't know if it's, again, boy, boy or girl, but they say um, they know that's not the official reporting name that it's actually fell on. But Su-57, is that likely to show up? Not unless they're crazy. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure what a Su-57 would get them uh, other than a spot on the Oryx website when somebody sends cell phone image of the wreckage. Um, you know, you're not going to deliver any more firepower. Your pilots, whatever you have, are test pilots. They're not tactical pilots. The airplane hasn't been rung out yet. The munitions that the Russians have for it are not that great. I don't. It's not going to tilt on the battlefield. I would keep those out of the battle because they will not have any kind of anything approaching a decisive military effect. And all they can do is provide the Ukrainians with good news and the Russians for bad news. Because if the, if the Russians succeed, and maybe let's say they shoot something with a Su-57. Uh, or even if they don't, they're going to claim they shot something with a Su-57, and nobody's going to believe them. Hmm. Because we've learned that Russian propaganda is exactly that, Russian propaganda. And they're not going to have video, so it's going to be pictures or it didn't happen, dude, and there are going to be no pictures. Whereas if you've got this nice little Su-57 tail with a red star on it sticking out of a smoking hole in the ground, 
The Ukrainians are going to be dancing and singing traditional folk songs as they dance around the circle and film it. <laughs> and that's not good for uh, Russia either. So, um, yeah, I don't think we're going to see any of the advanced aircraft tried because there's no military benefit to doing it and nothing but a whole bunch of downsides, particularly as more anti-aircraft systems arrive in Ukraine. Hmm. But I can tell you that Ukrainian MiG and Sukhoi pilots would practically be like hiding each other's flight helmets to get an opportunity to the first guy to go after one of those. It's it's a uh, it's not on any of the uh, pre 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 sort of uh, posted questions, but I'm just curious to know: Do you get any sense as to how hungry Russian pilots are? Uh, I mean, is there is there any? sort of other than the usual propaganda channels, is there any sort of telegram channel that you monitor or anything like that? There's, there's one I think called Fighter Bomber that's run by somebody who flies Su-34s that, that indicate how hungry they are for the fight. You know, there's the, in the US Air Force, people talk about the fangs coming out and, you know, they want to go out there and do the job. Do you think the Russians are the same? Uh, I think that you will be, you'll be, if you're a fighter aviator, you're predisposed to have the fangs out. But there's a difference between, I mean, fangs out is a tactical in the moment thing. Right where you're, you're at the edge of a fight and you want to get into a fight. Um, fighter aviators are usually fairly intelligent. Um, uh, well, Wizzos anyway. Um, and the uh, they they generally regard they 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 feel badly about doing stupid stuff. And so, what is the purpose of a fighter aircraft? The purpose of a fighter aircraft is to get a fighter aviator in the right place, in the right time, with the right tools to perform a military mission and generate some mayhem. Okay, That's what the purpose of the fighter is. It's to move the fighter aviator around with a bunch of high explosives and sensors. And so if you think like you're dropping bombs on suspected truck parks in the jungle, your motivation gets lower. Uh, so I think that any Russian aviator will be the kind of individual that will run to the sound of the guns, but that they're not necessarily going to be terrifically enthusiastic about, you know, flying into a wall and, and, you know, adding one more coffin to the count for the motherland. That's, that's not how I read that. They're going to want to believe that they can have an effect. Uh, and they will, I mean, they will believe they can have an effect if they are appropriately employed but there's no element of the Russian military that is appropriately employed. Okay, so as, as a follow-on to that, then Jim had asked, um, what do you think, Star Baby, that we can infer from Russian performance in relation to potential Soviet performance in a balloon has gone up type scenario in the Cold War? Uh, so uh, I guess what he's asking whether or not we had overestimated their capability and their ability to perform. Um, so... He's asking, were we overly conservative in the way that we assess their capabilities? We were always overestimating some of their technical capabilities. Um, the, the Fox Bat being a prime example of that is we completely overestimated the Fox Bat. For that matter, we overestimated the Flogger. And if you were to listen to Paco's podcast, your Paco episode, um, you would he would explain how you had overestimated uh, the flogger. We may have underestimated the MiG-21, so it's not always in one direction. And I would say that I think that the Russian military has devolved from the Soviet military. I think by the time the the, the wall came down, so the, the late 80s and around 1990, we had a pretty good idea and our expectations of the Russians were reasonable in terms of how much they had, how they intended to use it, and what the quality of their gear was. And I think that applies in air, ground, and naval regimes. So because the Russians, the, because the Soviet Union collapsed, and the Russians tried a bunch of reforms after 2008 that appear not to have worked, and because the Russian training system is essentially predatory and not equipped for mass mobilization, I, I, I don't think that the current Russian performance is a good bellwether of how the Soviets might have performed in 1989 or 1990 time frame. Okay. What, what about the future then? Do you think 
the Russian system is geared up to take something like their performance or non-performance in this war uh, and learn from it? Uh, I mean, are they so institutionally corrupt and sort of insulated that they're always going to do their artillery fires doctrine, there won't be any change, they're not going to look towards combined arms as a, as a way of waging war. What's your sense as to what they'll get out of this experience? It depends on how severe the societal change is. I mean, there was a difference between a czarist military and a Soviet military. They did, they were able to learn lessons. They have successfully learned lessons even after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, we saw new aircraft designs and new methods coming out after the Russians discovered that their forward air control was crap in in Georgia and that their drones were garbage and that the Georgians were looking at them for drones they had no answer to. They all made changes to that. What's going to make things hardest for the Russians is that it is an incredibly corrupt society and government. And there's there's been some great Twitter traffic going on for at least six weeks about 1.5 million sets of military cold weather gear that nobody can find, which I think is awesome. Canada, by the way, donated 550,000 sets of winter gear to Ukraine, and the Russians have enough to equip everybody, you know, west of the Ural Mountains with two full sets on paper. Okay, and all that's going to happen with that on paper cold weather gear is if you could find the paper, you could burn it and you'd be warm for a minute and a half. So um, the Russian societally, the educational system is not bad, but on a downhill slide. They have trouble encouraging innovation. They were really back into a lot of thought suppression and they have just lost a million people between 700,000 and a million people between January and today that have been smart enough to get out of the country. Mm. So they're going to have a hard time regenerating from this. But, you know, it's a big country with a long history and a lot of resources. They can regenerate if they don't continue to handicap themselves. Okay, final, final question on Ukraine. We're 50 minutes in and let's take the the audio hiccup at the beginning as a, a spare five minutes for us to get back but uh sci-fi concept actually asks i suppose the existential question which is um you know there's obviously been significant cost to lives um financially and so on um and he's asking what's the end goal is it achievable and is it worthwhile yeah so the end goal is the restoration of Ukraine to its rightful 2014 borders, which the Russians, by the way, agreed to in writing several times before 2014. Um, that's the that's the end condition. Um, and of course, the Russians pay reparations like any other aggressor should be forced to pay reparations. That might be easier because so many Russian assets have been frozen by the international community uh, that we hope that. Uh, they can actually get reparations out of them. Hmm. And so I'm not saying anything that President Zelensky hasn't said. Is it worth it? It is absolutely worth it. And it is, uh, aside from the whole Western alliance, I'm an American, I have no dog in this fight, but I have an interest in a Western security regime. You know, that's one way to look at it. But from a Ukrainian standpoint, you know, no responsible government can maintain legitimacy by leaving a whole bunch of their citizens in the hands of the Russians. And, and we have seen that and we see it every day. And one of the things I want to add on to victory conditions is all the children who have been stolen, kidnapped by the Russians and moved back into Russia also have to be returned to Ukraine. Mm. Um, so yes, it is absolutely worth it. If your homeland is attacked, you have the right to defend it. If you are the government of that territory, you have the obligation to defend your territory and your people, whatever it takes, or you've got no business being in government. So this question was asked prior to U.S. entry in the Second World War. Was it worth it to fight in Europe? Come to think of it, U.S. entry prior to the First World War as well. Um, was it worth it? Was it worth it to help our allies on the continent? Was it worth it to you know, fight the Nazis in Europe. 
And the answer is, of course it was. And, you know, a Western democracy uh, really in the European continent can do nothing else. And so when you see the argument that it's best to stop the bloodshed, it's best for who? When you talk about stopping the bloodshed in a condition like it is today, that's best for the Russians because they get what they've taken and they're left in a position where as they regroup, they can do it again. And Ukraine cannot possibly accept that. The Western alliance cannot accept that. Hmm. So I hope that that pretty much uh, answers the, you know, the question from a thoughtful analysis standpoint. But uh, holy cow, man, you just got to defend your territory and you can't let your people leave your people in the hands of the Russians. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, even even if you listen to the Russian side and believe it, um, Ukraine is just the start of a big shopping list of territory to reclaim. It's no, there's no way you can just allow them to go, to go in and do this because where would it end? Right, and the Baltic republics have been saying, "Hey, the Russians are they, for years they've been saying to NATO, hey, these guys are a real problem,' and and NATO." particularly led by Germany, has said, no, no, engagement is the way to bring the Russians. And the Baltics have been going, no. And now they're going quite justifiably, I told you so. Mm -hmm. And within the past 48 hours, the Polish Minister of Defense, um, let me put my plug in for Poland, yay Poland. Um, the Polish Mi Minister of Defense said, the Russians are always at war. And we in Poland recognize that they're always at war. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question there either. Okay, Star Baby, thank you for that. So, um, and thank you to the audience for posting questions and uh, on Discord and here live. I'm sorry if I didn't get to all of your questions, but I do want to try and keep us to, to 90 minutes, which means we've got 40 or so minutes left and there's still much to cover. Uh, we're going to be doing this every month, so there is an opportunity for you to come to Discord and to post your questions for the next AMA. I'll stick a channel up for that at some point in the coming week and you can go and pop your question in there uh, there were a couple of co other questions came through i didn't answer because i didn't ask because i think they've already pretty much been answered by star baby already so at this point i would just say um as a little plug because the podcast is free i do ask something in return and, and that is that you like the video and that you share it if you like it and i won't put in such strong terms as i did last time what you should do if you don't enjoy it but i can see we've got about 125 people listening um, I'm guessing you're enjoying it, and uh, if you are not enjoying it, then just tell us why, because feedback means that we can um, act on it and, and get us to a point where you are enjoying it next time. And if you are enjoying it, then just hit the thumbs up and give us a like. And think about your friends, your colleagues, your family, anybody you think who might enjoy this, even if you're actually listening to this um, later. So today is the 14th of October 2022. If you're listening to it anytime after that, you can still share it and send it out to people who you think would enjoy it. Because that's what we're looking for. We're looking to get these views, these stories out to as many people as possible and liking it, sharing it, leaving a comment, all that stuff drives the YouTube algorithm and, and makes it more likely that it's going to be recommended in the stream, which is actually the best way of getting your content viewed. So there we go. Okay. Now... Plus it'll boost my ego. Plus it'll boost your ego. need that. So, and that is that is the prime objective. I wasn't going to say it, but uh, there we go. Um, My prime objective, it's not yours. <laughs> so I did want to, um, I, I've talked a little bit about um, the Discord channel. In fact, I've talked quite a lot about that. Uh, I had an idea that um, just as an interlude, let me see if I can just do something here. Um, no, it's not working. Um, Yes, I had, an, I had an idea. It was just an interlude. I could, I could highlight my favorite post of the month, again, because we're doing this every month. But the reality is I only looked at back over the last day or so. Um, and at any rate, the, um, my favorite post of the month goes to Chris, who looked at this inscription. Somebody posted, um, it's a fantastic book by a guy called Heater Heatley, um, F-14 guy. He was an advisor on Top Gun, was a, a 4470 test Red Eagle pilot, an amazing guy. He wrote this inscription and uh, quite rightly, the poster on Discord was very proud of it and uh, posted the picture of it. But Chris managed to find in that inscription a penis. So uh, he wins my prize for, but well, there is no prize, he doesn't get anything, he's just getting kudos here live uh, for the best post of the month. Well done, Chris. Uh, I'll be looking to see what else comes along in the next month or so. Now, back to serious matters at hand. 
I said right at the beginning that we were going to talk about two news items that I picked up on during the last month. This isn't really a news item, although it was. It did come into my news stream. So um, Dave Deptula and Mark Gunzinger, that's a cool name, have penned this article for the Mitchell Institute um, around the um, sort of policy of uh, divestment that the US Air Force has followed for a number of years. Um, and so Dave has called the Air Force as, at its current stage the smallest and least capable Air Force. He's, I've made some notes here, so I am reading off a piece of paper. That's how organized I am. Talks about the shrinking force and the current budget for the next five years being insufficient to allow the Air Force to grow. And in fact, there being potentially um, a thousand aeroplanes divested and not replaced over the course of the next five years. And that's across fighter, bomber, ISR, all the fleets. Everybody's affected by it. And I would encourage everybody to go and read this. If you're on this podcast, you probably would find it interesting. It's only about 35 pages, and it's actually a, a pretty easy read. Light on some detail in some places. We're not going to go through it all now. There's a particular point I'm going to pick up with Star Baby. Um, but his point is that the um, estimation uh, amongst the intelligence community in the U.S. is that in 2027, that will be when China is most likely to be able to support a military conflict that takes Taiwan. So at the point at which the Air Force is at its nadir, uh, its low point, it's the least capable Air Force ever, um, and it will be expected to fi fight its core mission, which is to fight one war, to deter another war, and to defend the homeland, it will be the least capable of doing any of those things. So in the paper, there's quite a lot of detail in terms of statistics around um, sort of high-level um, metrics. So they talk about 80% of fighters currently in the Air Force inventory already exceed their design life. And we've seen that with the F-15, the F-16. We've seen the B-1 being retired. We've seen the F-15 EX come along, older F-15s going to the boneyard. But interestingly, they call out that only 24% of the force is what they call stealthy. And they, they're defining that as being survivable against modern threats. And they don't define what those threats are. Um, so that's, you know, maybe... Uh, detail we don't really need for the moment but it does relate to something then that we talked about on the discord channel and we have done a couple of times around the f-22 and the infamous 187 um, limit that was put in place by uh, robert gates when he was defense secretary and star baby your view on the discord channel was that actually that was probably not a bad thing the f-22 is range limited doesn't have the weapons carriage capability to really be um, most effective in combat. Um, but here we're seeing Dave Dutchula and, and Gunzinger talk a little bit about how we need to, we should have bought more. We, I say we, you, I'm not American, you should have bought more F 22s. Um, and that it was short sighted not to do that. And that what drove the assumption that 187 would be enough was that China would be slow to generate its or create its first fifth gen fighter. And that assumption has been proven incorrect. So, the point of this topic is to ask you for your view on that then, Star Baby. So obviously it's a it's a, a big subject. I don't want to tackle all of it, but I do want to look at the F-22 piece and get your assessment for, on the 187 by. Um, one of the things that this piece here talks about in some, you know, repeatedly is the size of the Indo-Pacific theater. One of the comments you made on Discord was that the F-22 has short legs. And those two things don't seem to jive to me. So... What's your position on the F-22 by, and what's your position, and I know you know Dave Deptula, you said that he handed you this paper in person, but what's your position on the paper as well? So Dave Deptula and I agree in a great many things, um, and he is absolutely right about the funding issues, and it's kind of boring, but the reality is when you look at an Air Force budget, a huge chunk of that budget is passed through, I meaning the Air Force does not get the money we support other things that the US government does, like for example, the GPS satellites, et cetera. So what he's been pointing out is that the budget looks bigger than it actually has been for a very long time. And when you look at the individual services, it's the US Air Force that has been the lowest on the real funding as opposed to the bookkeeping funding. That's because of pass through. We talk about light blue and dark blue money. All right, having gotten that out of the way, because I certainly agree with General Deptula, I do not agree with him on the value of stealth. Not anymore. Um, in terms of that being the number one criteria by which you judge all future combat aircraft, it is and it always has been range and payload. And the F-35 and the F-22 do were not designed for the Indo-Pacific theater, and they do not have the range and payload they need to fight in it. 
Uh, and the reason they don't is because they have to carry their weapons internally in order to maintain their low radar cross section. I will also say that the when we talk about stealth, um, there's a lot of components to stealth. When you look at the F-117, you had something that was hard to hear, hard to see, that sucked in all its radio antennas, that had no radar altimeter, had no radar. Um, it They basically took all of the ways you could detect an airplane and minimized it. That's not the case with the F-35 and the F-22. I mean, they're loud, for example. They're afterburner equipped, for example. The F-35, which is remarkably, I mean, it's it, it's great from a radar standpoint. It's it's actually amazing. And then they mount the hottest jet engine ever put in a fighter on it and still try to make the argument that they're stealthy. Okay, In the IR spectrum, they're not necessarily that stealthy. Um, But... What we're seeing in Ukraine is what I've been advocating, and I'm not the only one advocating this, is low altitude. Low altitude. It doesn't matter what your radar cross-section is if you do if the sensor does not have line of sight to you. You know, it doesn't matter how, how, the, how good the radar is or bad the radar is or how low your radar cross-section is if there is a mountain between you and the radar. And again, what we're seeing in Ukraine is the way they are handling a very intense air defense threat that is exactly what General Deptula is writing about. SA-20s, SA-21s, um, SA-22s, SA-15s, the Ukrainians have handled it by going lower. And they go lower with their helicopters, they go lower with their ground attack, and they go lower with the fighters. And so when you look at the Pacific, um, the number of F-22s we bought was irrelevant. By the time we got to 187, where the buy truncated, the design and the philosophy behind the F-22 had already been overtaken. The way to handle the F-22 problem would have been not to cancel the F-22 and buy more F-35s. It would have been to cancel the F-35 and built an FB, long-range, high-payload version of the F-22. Or maybe buy the YF-23 in the first place, but that's even farther back. So if you're going to fight in the Indo-Pacific, it's range and payload. We did not use B-17s a lot in the Pacific because that was a long-range bomber in Europe, and it did not have the range. It got used in the Philippines and, and um, you know, out of Australia, etc. But you had to have the B-29 for the Pacific. You needed high-altitude, long-range, heavy payload in order to uh, carry the air battle in. And that has not changed. The geography trumps the technology. Uh, there's another aspect to this, and I'm not going to go into it. We could go on forever. If anybody cares to read it, you can look up the Strategic Interdiction Trilogy and just search for it with Petruca. And I lay it all out in, like, I don't know, 9,000 words or less or more, whatever. Um, that's why it's a trilogy, right? So your strategy has to be right. And when you look at fighting China, you have to realize that China is a maritime nation and it's an island. And I paused because people right now are thinking, China's not an island. This dude is a dumbass. If you actually look at flows, what goes across the border, what goes across the border on the roads, the trains, the pipelines, the air traffic, and the sea lanes, 96% of that stuff comes overseas. It might as well be an island. Mm -hmm. And that gives you options, like options that we used against Japan in the Second World War, for dealing with it, but it all comes back to you have a basing problem in Pacific because the distances are large and you need range and payload, and neither the F-22 or the F-35 is right for the Indo-Pacific fight. What is the answer then? Because because going back and buying FB-22s obviously is, is well, I'm assuming it's not an option. Um, the F-22 is 20, what, 20, 25 years old now. I mean, you you want to build something else. So you've got next-gen air defense fighter, which apparently is being digitally prototyped at the moment. Do you have a suspicion that that will answer the question? I, I, I don't know anything about it. I can't even guess because everything I've heard is contradictory. Um, I hope the Air Force is smart enough to consider range and payload, but I fear that they're not because they haven't been. What's the answer? Well, you say the F-22 and the FB-22 not an option. You know, this F-15 EX is an airframe that flew in the 70s. So the old airframe can't turn it into something new argument. Don't buy it at all. If it's a good design, it's a good design. The systems have improved. 
um, what might we be able to do uh, with a different design? And again, outside the scope of this is I think you can get a lot, even with your existing aircraft, if your strategy is not a repeat of the Desert Storm, where you think you're going to be bombing ground targets in Shanghai with JDAMs. Hmm. You're not. Find another way. You know, you can't have the magic equipment you want. Um, so adjust the strategy. That's the obvious answer. And uh, TX Hamas who's a Marine Corps colonel at the National War College, has written one of the talks similar to Strategic Interdiction. Actually, he predates my writings on Strategic Interdiction, what he calls offshore control. Look at the strategy. You can't go, you can't treat China like it's Iraq. Um, you have to look at other aspects for it. That's the solution. The solution is to get your strategy right. I think one of the questions that might have been down for sort of general uh, questions um, later in this conversation was about the uh, resumption of low-level tactics. What sort of strategy would then inform the use of low-level tactics? Because you've got, uh, if you think geographically about it, you think so the Taiwan, you know, the position of Taiwan, the fact that it's you know sort of open sea out there to the east, um, U.S. air bases in Guam, you know maybe some operations out of Japan, but the approaches seem to be very exposed so uh, are you are you suggesting you would go low over the sea or are you suggesting that you would get inland somehow and then go low i've gone low over the sea i've attacked the you know the 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 old napoleonic era windows under dover castle yeah so we used to do um gbu 24 vertical target attack runs against those windows uh, absolutely come in low against every naval aviator who has ever thought about employing an anti-ship cruise missile comes in low over the ocean. Uh, yeah, absolutely will come in low over the sea. How, but what about fuel? So you're burning a ton of fuel down there and you've got, you're, you're very exposed. They presumably the Chinese have great, um, you know, capability of their own in terms of threat systems. So they're going to see, you know, your... the earth is a sphere, right? Say again? You know, the earth is spherical, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you don't have to fly low when you're over the horizon. I thought they would bounce and off. Don't they the bounce horizon. off the ionosphere? Don't they bounce so, right off the ionosphere? Okay. You can, but not a target tracking radar. Okay. They don't, so need, they don't need to track you, though. They just need to know you're coming. They're going to know you're coming from when you took off and somebody placed a cell phone call. And they say, oh, cruise speed, 480 knots, ground speed, ah, it'll be here in, you know, three hours and 22 minutes. Do, do you have the fuel in, in something like it? So you you were an F-15E guy, but uh, something like an F-15EX, um, you know, GE motors, but broadly the same airframe. You got the fuel in that to do that kind of thing? Or are you going to re rely no, on, on uh, stealthy tankers? <laughs> Back to stealth. Non-stealthy tankers, right, over the horizon. <laughs> Nobody kicks ass without tanker gas. Okay, so that's an opening argument. Um, and yes, your tankers, uh, stealthy tankers, that's another one of the, not to be insulting or anything, because we know that I'm never insulting. Um, stealthy tankers is like one of the dumbest ideas ever. Um, because that's just putting a thing full of gasoline that has to, to saunter up next to a whole bunch of other things full of you know jet fuel and you know, orbit in a predictable pattern, and you're going to do that inside an air defense envelope? Of course you're not. Um, can you fly a tanker at low altitude where you're over the horizon, you know, and effectively do things that way? Yes, guys have done low-altitude refueling. Special ops guys do really low-altitude refueling. Uh, you know, I've been in the back of a helicopter when I was uh, logging my door gunner time in the paved lows. And we're ridiculously low altitude refueling from a C-130 at ridiculously low airspeed. Do, um, do you think it makes a difference whether it's a manned platform or not? So uh, I, I, I appreciate the distinction between it's a bad idea because you won't accomplish the mission because the tankers will get shot down. Um, and it's a bad idea because people will die. But if you had a fleet of um, stealthy unmanned air refueling platforms, would that would that change your view on it? Not a teeny tiny bit, because I actually think you'll lose more of them in uh, mishaps that would have been avoided if you had a manned crew. Okay. Aircraft malfunctions leading to degraded modes, 
Um, you know, we see this all the time with the unmanned aircraft. Um, I would not fly in an unmanned airliner hmm. from New York to Aberdeen in the winter. Are you kidding me? I wouldn't even send mail on that. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Now, just really quickly, because you did mention it. YF-23, I had Paul Metz on the channel. He was uh, one of the two test pilots. He was the chief test pilot for the YF-23, but um, one of the two test pilots who flew it. But he, he was very diplomatic at, when I asked him whether or not the YF-23 um, should have won over the YF-22. Um, but it was pretty clear he thought it should have. What's your view on that, then? You you just referenced a, an, an opinion. Um, what and why? My view is semi-uninformed um, because the... We're kind of like comparing the F-22 to the YF-23. I think the F-22 was selected for the wrong reasons. I think that the hypermaneuverability, the super cruise, that's all unnecessary bullshit. Need to have. It's not It's not range and payload. Hmm. Um, and the YF-23 had more room for range and payload. So, by the way, did a couple of the fb22 designs that i've seen one of which was actually from the manufacturer um they had more potential it it's it's just that i think that like the f16 xl and the f15 e um the f16 xl was not a bad airplane it was marvelous but it did not have the potential that the uh, F-15 E did have and I, so I think that at the end of the day the YF-23 by nature of its design had more potential for growth uh, you know range and payload in particular than the, the YF-22 did yeah I'm just, just looking at the chat uh, just some, some of the comments that are being made I don't know if you can see them as well but um, there was an I was going to mention the KC-46 I thought well, I'm a European and you didn't go you guys didn't go down the MR-300 route and you probably should have, um, but but quickly because uh, Mark Brown, I think it was mentioned it. KC forty six thoughts. KC triple seven. Does that exist? Only designs exist. One a prototype was never built, and one of the reasons I'm told was that Boeing wanted to extend the seven six seven production line rather than the the triple seven the specs i saw in the triple seven and they were boeing specs blew everything else away mm -hmm. yes it was also more expensive um and it would have competed with a very active triple seven line rather than extending a 767 line um but there's also an industrial base anybody that thinks it honestly that the united states congress was going to allow the u.s to buy a Airbus tanker design, they're smoking their own socks. It doesn't matter that they would have set up a factory in somewhere in the South where a critical pair of senators happened to live. Uh, we were not going to buy a French tanker regardless. Did So I, I, I'm, I'm definitely going out on a limb here, but hasn't the, Air, hasn't the US bought its new Marine One helicopters from Leonardo or someone like that? Aren't the new helicopters for the president European? Have I got that sure, wrong? it's not it's not a wide body airliner. Yeah, but it's buying something that's symbolic from. Uh, it's from not the buying something that's foreign is bad, right? So we get our new rocket motors from Norway, you know, for the Amram. Um, we we buy plenty of European components. Um, the 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 Carl Gustav recoilless rifles are Swedish. I mean, I'm sure that somebody that was the 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 T seven. The T-7 is a Swedish-U.S. collaboration. Parts of that aircraft are built in Sweden. Hmm. So it's not the big picture. We can't buy things from our allies because we do. I mean, there's a there's a ghost bat. Boeing has got a ghost bat MQ-28 for test. Where did that come from? That came from Boeing Australia. That did not come from Boeing St. Louis. It's that in the airliner um, market, okay, which is a constant battle between only two manufacturers boeing and airbus everything else is a sideshow on the big picture long-range airliners the u.s is not going to undermine its own industrial base in the airliner market okay it's a boring argument i'm sorry well let's let's liven things up a little bit do you know 
I, did, I only found this out this week. I was reading another website. Do you, Ghost Bat, the name for that uh, sort of royal wingman design. Do you know what that refers to? There's a, a sort of, um, I, I don't know, a slang, a sort of vernacular meaning to Ghost Bat. And if Mrs. Petruca, if you're listening, you might want to just mute it. For, for, well, no, she's this. lived in Australia. She understands completely. Okay, so, Go. So Ghost Bat is, Ghost Bat is somebody who secretly masturbates at work. Okay, so I'm I I can now not wash my brain of that, and neither can anybody else. Um, that is apparently what goes back is. We've we've got an Aussie listening. I don't know if he's still listening, but if you if you're listening, tell us whether or not it's right or wrong. That's what I heard. Anyway, let's let's thanks. move on. You, I did tell you. I did tell you. Right. Okay. Let me share my screen one more time on this side. All right. So. Uh, Red Six. So this is this company. It's owned and run by a Brit, former fast jet guy. Um, as I understand it, he flew on exchange with the Air Force. U.S. Air Force was the first F-22, non, non-American F-22 pilot fly, flew on exchange. And he now runs this business in the States that is uh, building a helmet and an associated um, visual sort of projection system onto the inside of the visor. Um, where I guess it's like a sort of a, a posh sort of fancy version of Jahamix or whatever, um, where synthetic imagery is presented and you can then train. And what I'd like to do, because we've been talking a lot, people might want to go and use the bathroom or something. Uh, how many people are still on? Let's have a quick look. One minute. I think we've still got 125 people. That's that's pretty good. We haven't, we haven't bored them all to death yet. Um, but I'm going to pl- I'm going to play the video, and then I'd like to use, get your thoughts on pros and cons of of augmented reality, synthetic training. Um, you know, it's a fairly contentious issue. I know over here with the Royal Air Force pushing more for it, and you know, fast jet guys being a bit unhappy about it. But uh, let me let me try and play the video, and uh, I don't know if everybody at home will get the audio from the video. So. So you say? You don't see the screen? Not on my main screen. I'm looking at YouTube and I. Oh no, you're good. Okay, so there we go. So I'm, I don't know if you guys had audio issues with that, but on my end, the audio cut out me a bit through. It doesn't really matter. It's just a fancy video. It's some marketing. But um, at any rate, um, I guess over the last sort of 10, 15 years, I, I've witnessed as an outsider looking in things like distributed mission system you know, simulators that are networked together. So you can have a bunch of F-16, F-15, AWACS, you know, various platforms all talking together, flying in the same uh, virtual environment, but being physically distributed around the world and, and, and the training value there. And I guess this is sort of a, 
uh, a step towards going back into the cockpit and instead of having you know a bunch of people in your flight maybe some of those are simulated you can put a su-27 in there and and simulate it and actually fly against it for real uh, is it a gimmick that's the first question no this is freaking awesome uh this is the next generation in training where you're putting together a bunch of live virtual constructive concepts from decades back really starting with acmi the air combat maneuvering instrumentation that allows you to do the debrief stuff and moving along um so the short answer is it's awesome and i'll probably have to explain why later what what is what is your thoughts or what are your thoughts then generally on the utility or so the utility of synthetic training uh, let's say first of all, and then the implications of an over reliance on that, and what and what where do you, what is a what is an over reliance on that? How do you know you've reached an over reliance on spending time in the sim versus in the real airplane? So, um, I I've flown all the way from old F four uh, style. You know, you're always doing an instrument approach kind of simulator where it's only good for emergency procedures, up to the high end dome simulators in St. Louis. And so what I what your basic simulator is always good for is it's good for practicing your switches and it's good for practicing your emergency procedures. So the first time you see an EP, um, an emergency, an emergency and you run an emergency procedure, ideally, that should not be in the jet. You know, the one time Bossa and I had our utility hydraulic failure, we've done this dozens of times in the simulator. So that was nothing really new. We knew how that was going to go. Um, and that that is really just enormously helpful to get through on routine stuff, on flying your instrument approaches, all things you can do in a in a, 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 a just a cockpit with some fairly limited support. Um, when you start feeding in the radar, now you can look at radar procedures. And yes, you know your simulated sensor image. Once you get to a more modern system and you have a targeting pod, right? We now you have what kind of simulation do you have we actually did some work at uh, uh at st louis boeing whereby we were introducing uh di guy which was video game style individuals moving around in the target pod scene because it was generating a three-dimensional moving picture with up to 20 dudes and we put you know we put combatants and non-combatants in the targeting pod picture for close air support stuff so you're getting better and better as it goes along so simulators also can be good for, you know, planning your long range tactics where it's about sensor management, shot management, communications. And that's where linking multiple computers, multiple simulators together in a, with a common picture added in. Where you missed out was it doesn't teach you about anything about actually performing the aircraft. And I also think there's a difference in response between a new guy and an old guy in a simulator. So when I got to the dome simulators for the first time, I had 1,700 fighter hours. And I was at Boeing, and I was flying in the front seat, which is not my cockpit. Um, and I'm dealing with an air picture at low altitude, and I'm sailing along, and I spend too much time in the radar, and I come up, and I watch as this ridge line flashes by me, and my radar altimeter indication flashes to 16 feet, and I'm in a cold sweat because I know I just almost killed myself. I'm at 1G at zero knots in a semi-comfy chair in St. Louis. But the back of my brain did not know that because I was getting a whole lot of cues that my trained brain understood as being in a tactical real-world environment. I don't think you get that same response out of a new guy because they haven't built all those reactions. So when you get to the idea of you are actually flying an aircraft and you have a virtual opponent you have made the leap. You have made the leap to where you are actually having to perform the aircraft. You are feeling how it performs. You are hearing the jet noise. You are pulling the Gs. And this is much better than having a, a another similar aircraft or contract red air for air-to-air -air training is how I suspect it works out because now you can work in a whole bunch of other cues. I can tailor the aircraft. I can tailor the paint scheme. Um, I can't really adjust the time of day, and that's going to be an interesting challenge for them, right, to to deal with lighting conditions. How do you deal with lighting conditions when this thing's moving around? But if a guy drops flares, you know, he drops real flares and he doesn't need FAA, 
clearance to do it. If a guy employs simulated jamming and your radar acts like the jamming is effective, I don't need clearance to do that. Chaff, countermeasures, smoke trails, missile traces. When you think you've got this guy nailed and you've forgotten he has a high off foresight missile and that thing comes whipping around the corner and now you're defensive from an offensive position. This is the next leap, and I think it's going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread if they can pull it off. You, you reference then a challenge around lighting conditions. What other challenges are, are you thinking of? I mean, I, one, one thing, for example, in my mind is around uh, AI. So uh, one of the questions I've got to ask you in a minute from uh, the Discord is what you think about DCS, and, and you already told me privately about that. But uh, one thing that they've done recently, you know, these guys, they, they do this for a living. They build flight simulators. They build AI routines. Okay, they're not military aviators. They might not know all the tactics and, you know, exactly how something should, should react to a, a certain set of conditions. But they're smart enough to be able to put together some fairly interesting stuff. And, and even they are struggling to not basically create a set of canned scenarios. That's what I've read. I haven't actually experienced that myself because I haven't played the game since the updates. But that's what I've read. Um so is AI the limitation uh, that they have to overcome in, you know, from a, a behavioral point of view? What, what, what are you looking at and thinking, well, this is where it could fail? Um, so I don't think it could fail. I just think it's going to be a difficult challenge. So the lighting issue kind of refers to the with individual range fight. And here I am. I'm going to talk to my hands, right? So a guy turns into you or does he turn away to you? It's a different situation. And the lighting, not only the paint job of the airplane – but the lighting conditions will affect how quickly you can do that. And so in your virtual world, you have to know where the sun is and you have to know the sunlight effects on this 3D model that you are generating virtually because it's easy to be fooled. That's why the Canadians are total jerks because they paint a fake canopy on the bottom of the CF-18 Hornets. So it delays you a couple seconds. Is that guy turning into me or is he turning away? Well, he's a Canadian. Of course he's turning into you <laughs> because he's about to violate the thousand foot bubble around your airplane, leave you shaking after a close pass and circle around behind you because you don't have the situational awareness to call knock it off. Not that I've ever seen that. Um, but, you know, absent the knowing that they're Canadians and of course he's turning into me, you know, that is a delay. And so that's going to be you know, harder to replicate, but I'm not sure it matters that much and it won't cause failure of the system. You could paint the bottom, the virtual aircraft would be blue on top and red on the bottom and you're still going to have to perform your aircraft. You're just, you're just going to recognize the picture easily. And frankly, when I'm initially training a pilot to maneuver, I might want to have it be that freaking obvious for the initial steps, you know, black, white, red, you know, blue, whatever you want to do make it easy for them to determine it because you still then have to learn how to perform your aircraft in that tools. The the fine tactical details can come level later. In terms of AI, AI is just fast math. Um, you know, that I, I took a course actually at a major university about artificial intelligence that I could literally not understand half of it because they were talking about coding and they had a whole section where they go to virtual Python coding. A Python's a freaking snake. Okay, that's what I know. <laughs> Okay, but here they are, they're Python coding, and they're really excited about it. And I'm off to get some Cheetos and some iced tea. <laughs> I don't even like Cheetos. And so what I learned from that, the reason I took the course was not because I was going to program artificial intelligence or something for machine learning, is I needed a better bullshit detector. I needed to know when somebody was talking smack against AI. And one of the things I learned out of that was it's just math. If you can't do it with math, you're not going to do it with AI. But what I also learned is that when you talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, you have to realize that it is not programmed. AI is trained. And you have to have a data set and you have to have a curated data set. And you have to, there's a lot of things that go into training it. And so I actually give, you know, I, I have a, a seminar on the training program of how you train an aviator because I think AI has to be trained the same way. When you get back into your virtual thing where you're recording the aircraft movement and where the sensors are and where the pilot's cranium is positioned and what the power setting is and where it's moving and of course you're doing the same thing for your artificially generated object that the pilot sees on the visor that is data and that is curated data and now I can learn so you're looking at using a machine learning technique to improve your artificial intelligence and it's only going to get better 
Um, so high processing capacity is the answer to all the little visual nuances you want, but machine learning and AI is the answer to why you don't want to have to have somebody come up with a bunch of pre-can routines when you can give them a pre-can starting point and a way to fly. You know, it's just like, um, you know, in some video games, you can select your style and capability of opponent. You know, this is the aggressive guy. This is the defensive guy. This is the resource management guy. This is the jerk. Um, you could potentially set all that for your opponent, depending on what your training objective is. It's going to be awesome. Excellent. Right. Let me see if there's any questions, because Scotty has gone quiet on my list of live questions. He did, in fairness, say he was going to do it on his lunch break and try not to spill food over his keyboard. Maybe he spilled food on his keyboard and it's still Food working. on his keyboard. <laughs> But let me just have a quick look at the chat then and just see whether or not anybody pinged any questions up around that. Uh, yeah, Skipjack says that the Sam, Sam fuse on that thing was shit. That's probably a fair point. Um, all right, ED, the bar has been raised, says Alex. Uh, I don't think there were actually any questions around that. So that's fine. Okay, so we will move on then to the last part of today. We're not doing too badly on time. We're on, we're on time, maybe another 15, 20 minutes, something like that. We'll see. I do still see 134 people, but only 97 likes. That's something wrong with that. Those numbers should match, really. 100, 135 uh, likes or something like that would be appreciated. So if you haven't already hit the like button, then, you know, there's nothing stopping you. Go ahead and do it, please. Right. So final section for today is a list of questions that have come through the chat live while we've been talking and also were pre-posted on Discord. Let's start with one of the pre-posted ones. Um, okay, because we're talking about it, let's just get this question out of the way from Ustio. What do you think of DCS? Are you interested in it? And DCS, everybody should know, Digital Combat Simulator, a series of, com of simulators made by um, Eagle Dynamics, a software publisher based out of Switzerland, I think. Um, tell us about DCS and your thoughts on it. It looks really interesting. I'm a Mac user, and it's not Mac compatible. And it is not my thing, because I don't do flight simulators uh, for fun. In the same way I don't do first-person shooters for fun because I cannot use the actual skills. I have to video game eyes my skills. And unless I have a dome simulator with a fighter cockpit, uh, I'm gonna feel let down. No matter how good all that stuff is and how cool the community is, I can't use my skill set. And the danger of that, of course, is what if I hopped into DCS with a strike eagle, you know, and hand controllers, and I've got this screen, and I suck. <laughs> Why would I set myself up for that? Um, you know, no, I did it right when I needed to do it. It's not my thing. That doesn't mean it's really cool. It's not really cool because I think it is really cool. But if I'm going to, you know, spend my time in a gaming environment, I want to play something like Timberborn where it's post-apocalypse punk beavers uh, building <laughs> communities Timberborn. in the Arizona desert. Timberborn, not kidding. That exists or it exists only in your head. No, it totally exists. It does, it does it? Oh, my goodness. Okay. T-I-M-B-E-R-B-O-R-N is the name of the game. It is a classic city builder, except with post-apocalyptic timber punk beavers. <laughs> okay. All right. Moving on, then. So, uh, but so actually, so before I do, Hacker Haskin was, I think, in the chat earlier. I don't know if he's if he's gone now, but uh, so he's a Strike Eagle, former Strike Eagle pilot, and he did come here and play DCS, and he was shit. At it, absolutely terrible, um, and uh, and so yes, I understand the um, trepidation around the fact you might try it and f find that you're the same. So um, that video actually is 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 on the channel somewhere. I think it might have been like my second or third interview I did with him, and he played that, and I filmed it. It's funny. Anyway, um, moving on. So um, it's funny for you. It was hilarious. It was okay. <laughs> So I, I really like this question from Ghost Dog. He just said, what was the dumbest mission you're glad you flew? This was actually a tough question, but I, I, I realized that I had an answer for it. So obviously we do flybys for funerals. Okay, Normally it's a military um, uh, person you know, buried at Arlington Cemetery or a national cemetery or something like that. 
you know, do flybys for our own. We'll do flybys for, you know, people that, that um, have earned uh, a flyby in some way. Um, or when we get directed to do it uh, for no good reason over Loyola University, which is another story. But the 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 dumbest story I, I ever flew wasn't really dumb. It was in Germany flying F4Gs, and I have Bassa. I have Brian Baxley in the back seat. And I don't remember the details. We seem to be coming home from across country because I remember having cargo pods on board. And we're not going to do a two a four ship flyby because we don't have four ships. We've got two. We're going to do a two ship flyby for Ernie Bolig's funeral. Why Ernie Bolig? Because he was the 81st Fighter Squadron's wine guy. They were the the, and we had been doing business with the Bullock family and still are, you know, in at Spangdalem for decades. The Bullocks and the Sebastianis uh, were were our wineries, and uh, the Ernie had died, and so we were going to do a flyby, and the weather sucked, and we're kind of jinking and jiving up the Mosul River, and I'm flying with Bossa, and we're in, I think in the number two because I remember just being at somebody's wings, and I remember thinking. You know, we're pretty close to the rated G limit on these cargo pods. I'm going to be pissed if all my underwear ends up in the in the Mosul River as we're trying to make this happen without hitting a hillside, a castle, a tower, <laughs> or each other. So that was it. You know, it was the un- we did the fly by. We did it on time, and you know, it's good that we had a couple of pilots with good hands. I don't remember who was in the lead, um, but that is definitely the dumbest flight I've ever been happy to do. <laughs> okay, another one I'm looking for. Okay, so this is from Gorio Productions. I like this one too. He said, drawing from uh, the intruder hijink. So he's he's an intruder uh, fan by all accounts. Um, he said, the, 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 B, the BN, <laughs> the Bombardier Navigator, had a had all the circuit breakers on his side so the, he could, the Bombardier Nav could move the pilot's seat all the way up and forward and then pull the circuit breakers. Uh, but the pilot could pull out the O2 tube from the uh, Bombardier Navigator right before the break. Are there any stories of chicanery like that from the Strike Eagle or F4? There are. Which ones are you going to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a couple. So the first, and they're both F4 related. So the F4 had 200 and some odd circuit breakers in the back seat. Some of them you actually used in normal procedures. Um, well, abnormal normal procedures, just like Tomcat guys pulling circuit breakers before they get into a, a training fight so they can turn better or mess with the wings. But the, the circuit breaker that comes to mind is the F4E model, which I flew before the Gs in training. When the gun fired, there's a little door in front of the, the windscreen that opens that's actually a ram air vent. It pops open when the gun is fired so that there is an airflow through the gun compartment in the nose to vent all the propellant gases that leak out of the gun into the nose because those gla- gases are still combustible. Pilots never, ever notice this door because when they're firing the gun, they're looking through the pipper and their their eyes are focused far so they never see the door. But you could sit here with the circuit breaker on the left side and you could pull that circuit breaker on a cross-country flight and the door would pop up and you could push it in and the door would come down again. Push it up. And so guys told me that you know, you would do things like open the door, close the door. Or you just wait and you open the door and you close the door. Eventually, the pilot's going to ask, and he's going to ask something like, "Hey, uh, you know that little door on the top of the nose that opens when the gun fires?" Because they know about it, they just never notice it. And you go, "Yeah," and you pull the breaker. You know what happens when that's opening and closing in flight? Oh, that's bad. That's really bad. Is that happening? No, no. I was just asking. That's the kind of thing you get. The thing I did in the G model on a cross country was you had a manual track mode in the radar, which was daft. Okay, whereby if you couldn't lock on, you could have a knob, and it's in the cockpit tour. So a knob that says V sub C that that varies the the closing rate of the target, and then you could use your hand controller on the right to move the radar beam left or right, and of course the thumb wheel to keep it in elevation, so you could manually track this target like that was ever going to work. But what you can also do is use it to simulate a manually tracked target. So I generated a simulated uh, UFO on a cross-country flight with John Fanning that kept coming at us and then turning away and then coming at us and turning away and varying speeds widely. He eventually caught on. I had nothing better to do. All right, next question. 
<laughs> okay. Um, this is from Pyro. So, so again, if you're not part of the um, Discord channel, then you should be joining us because we've got a bunch of subject matter experts. We've obviously got Star Baby, we've got Spectre Pilot, uh, we've got uh, Pyro, who was an EF 111 pilot, we've got Shari Z, who was also a Strike Eagle Wizzo and F4G EWO. Um, is he gone? God, I'm looking down at my piece of paper and he seems to have disappeared or transformed into a coat. No, I'm here. Oh, he's there. He's okay. Gone. You're not urinating or anything, are you? Um, no. Okay, so he says, Sapiro is asking, what was your most useful good luck charm? Um, and what's the story to go with it? So, um, yeah, was it uh, Nibor with a light, check, checklist edition, stopwatch, favorite map, gloves with fingers cut out, etc.? What was your. This f- is my G suit. Okay, all folded. This is my G suit bandana. That was one of my two good luck charms. I actually had another bandana that was a, a, um, a different color scheme. And I started flying this in the F4G because I hated having fingerprints and smears on all those cathode ray tubes in the back of the F4G and the APR-47. So I keep this so that I can clean all that garbage off my scopes. Okay, before I even power it up, because I hate smears on my scopes. It's like eagle guys hate bugs on their canopies. I hate smear on my scopes. And it goes on my G-suit and ties on the left leg. The other thing I always flew with that I did not have handy and I was not smart enough to pre-position is a wool blend hand-knitted scarf that is kind of a deeper green than the G-suit um, that I wore on every combat mission. It's a scarf for warmth. And, you know, I dressed for cold temperatures because the vast majority of my com I can't think of a warm combat sortie, you know, except maybe in it was getting warmer in uh, May of 99. Uh, but there were still mountains around. Right. So I always flew with a scarf. Every combat sortie I have, I've flown with that green scarf. So those are my good luck charms. And good on you, Pyro, for asking the question and knowing that I had to have one. He, his, his second part to the question was about ride smoothness let's say so he says the 111 was a pretty smooth ride what was your worst bumpy ride uh, so his worst was he said that he was flying t-37 just as the instructor gave him control of the airplane there was a strong downdraft um n- negative two g's and both bashed their heads on the canopy and the the instructor said lieutenant fritz it was perfectly trimmed when i shook the stick and gave it to you i don't remember a bumpy ride I remember a smooth ride, and that was my one ride in an EF-111 at Mach 1.2, 200 feet over the Saudi desert with the wings back and the ride set on hard. And uh, I flew with Fridge, so that's Walt Manuel, uh, call sign Fridge. Um, he was, we were doing, uh, right after the Gulf War, desert calm kind of time period, when we had nothing better to do, we'd swap aircraft rides among the two seaters so that we could give orientations to other aircraft. So I was flying the F-111, and man, we were so fast, we delaminated the wing gloves. Really? It's the fastest I've ever been at low altitude. If you convert it into miles an hour, it's 1,000 miles an hour at 200 feet. It's a rocking good time. So, and that is a smooth, a 111 is this, this well-tuned Cadillac of a ride on a smooth road. If I had a bumpy ride, it was probably in the T-37, but I don't remember it. But So to compensate, I'll tell you a T-37 story. So my first T-37 ride, I'm a cadet. Uh, I'm in summer field training, which is a field training for, for NAV students. And eventually there are other stories that will come out of that. But I was ready to fly the T-37 first, you know, military training jet. I'm pumped up. I I walk into the briefing room. I slap a $20 bill on the table and said, this says you can't make me sick. <laughs> because I wanted to guarantee the best possible ride I was going to get. It's a good ride. It also ended in my first emergency ground egress. <laughs> Go on, tell us. Go on. So, no shit, there I was. Um, I'd flown the ride. The, the instructor I got was a woman. So, in the first place, she's better physiologically for the whole air sickness thing. Um, and probably as a higher G tolerance, was instructor of the quarter. I mean, I really picked my targets. So they were picked for me. But we had a good, aggressive T-37 ride. And something, I think it was a hot break condition, happened on the rollout after we land. And I, as you've probably guessed, I pay very close attention to egress briefings on how your system works and all that. 
and I don't know what's going on. And she turns to me in the rollout and she says, do you remember how to get out of this thing? And I go, yeah. <laughs> and she says, when I stop, I'm going to pop the canopy. When I say go, you go. I'll meet you over there. Got it? And I go, yeah. And um, she stops the canopy lid, pops up. She goes, go, bang. I'm throwing straps. I'm disconnecting the little snap. You have to disconnect that little snap thing on a T-37 because it remains snapped to the aircraft. And that's for deploying the chute. Essentially, you use the aircraft to drag the parachute out because this is not an ejection seat with a chute. You're wearing the chute. So if you emergency ground egress and don't disconnect that snap, you are going to get precisely one parachute length <laughs> away from the airplane before you get hung up. So the snap goes and bang, and I am out of there and 25 meters off the corner of the airplane where the least number of fragments are supposed to go if it explodes before she has finished unstrapping and shutting down the airplane because I listen to the egress brief. Pretty sure it was hot breaks. Okay, uh, I think we'll do two more questions and then we'll we'll knock it off. Um, so let's just pick one from the live audience. I want to try and pick one that's light-hearted. Uh, none of them are. <laughs> They're all quite serious. Let's have a look then. Give me a serious question. Give me I a can serious question. Okay, so Jeffrey McQuaid, he hasn't he hasn't had a, a question asked so far. He asked two: How capable are Russian expendables, and do you know of any use of loitering anti-radiation missiles like the British Alarm? Ah, so yes. Um, the, the Russian flares are pretty darn good. Um, chaff is chaff, right? So it just comes out. It's a bunch of aluminized hairs. It makes a radar blob. Uh, the flares are so good that that is the reason why we had to develop the AIM-9 Mike-9 um, was because we got a hold of some Russian flares uh, and realized that things weren't going to work the way we thought we did. I can't talk about details on that, but let's say that the, the Dash 9 was developed specifically to counter some things we'd seen in, in Russian flares. That was 25 years ago. Um, so good flare systems. Hmm. Uh, what was the second half of that question? Uh, any, any, to your knowledge, any loitering anti-radiation missile type systems other than the British Alarm? Yeah, so the, the British Alarm was semi-loitering for people that don't know is that it had a parachute in it so if it didn't go directly towards its target it could wait out it, it could wait it would stay in the air and pop a parachute and jettison the rocket motor section and just this warhead and guidance package would float down with some fins and if the redetected radar would ditch the parachute and glide on into the target which was pretty darn neat um the israelis developed the harpy and the harpy is a propeller driven uh essentially cruise missile type thing that has been used successfully in lebanon and syria as a loitering anti-radiation missile that was, it was designed for the follow-on is called the hora uh and that has been used by azerbaijan in its conflict against armenia so loitering anti-radiation munitions are a thing they've been a thing for a long time the u.s tried to build one called tacit rainbow and the price, it just got out of control. This predates the Harpy, but the price system got out of control and the program was canceled. So, yes, there we go. Excellent. And and uh, Scotty has now come back from wherever he was because he's now updating questions that are live. So let's do two more. Have you got time? Got, you got ten more minutes? i got all freaking day. Okay. I haven't, so, <laughs> so we'll do ten more minutes. Because uh, <laughs> it's not daytime where I, you are. I want to stay married. Um, so we'll do Zerberger has asked could you talk about the benefits that you see personally from the pro proliferation of Acer radars in fighter aircraft um, LPI EW capabilities you know, the ability to do air to air and air to ground simultaneously what do you think about that then um, what are the benefits of that um, it's freaking awesome so the first I've only ever had an Acer in, in a simulator um, and so I was in the simulator in Boeing St. Louis, and I don't know I have an AESA. I had an APG-82, which is the new Strike Eagle radar in there. And I've got a bunch of air targets, and I've got them in search, and I lock the lead guy because I'm going to put an AMRAM at him, and I still have all my search symbology, and I still have all those other tracks. So I go, woohoo, and I lock the second guy, and I still have all my air search symbology, and I still have all the tracks. And I'm going... Bonus. 
what the hell? Lock number three, same. Lock number four, same. There's only four of them. So now I've got four stars with track bars, and I go, this is awesome because I still have my search symbology going. So it's step, shoot, step, shoot, step, shoot, step, shoot. Four AMRAMs in simulated air against simulated target. Oh, simulated AMRAMs. Um, in the simulator. And that was just freaking heroic. Because one of the things you had in the air-to-air -air fight is when you lock into a guy, you lost all the situational awareness of developing picture around them. Now with an ESA, you can generate multiple beams, which means more search volume covered in less search time with the ability to go single target track and put missiles on guys. It's unparalleled. From an air to ground standpoint, looking at it from, you know, with my iWizzo hat on, I I say, hey, my radar, bang, I drive the radar down. I'm going to take a, a, a map and I'm going to go through probably three iterations. And I'm going to get a picture I like. I'm going to freeze it. and I'm going to say your radar. So I've had the radar down for a handful of seconds. And now the pilot takes it back and we do air to air. So we lost all air to air situational uh, awareness. In that time, I could have just taken a beam and done the ground map and not touched the pilot's radar uh, and not impacted our situational awareness. If I decide I need a better picture as, I, as the angles change as we're getting closer or the range changes because we're getting closer, then I can just take a beam and make another ground map and I don't disrupt anything. And from a jamming perspective, keeping in mind that you can only jam things in the radar as band. Uh, but there is potential to do that. There's also potential to generate communications beams with your radar. So you could generate a high power directional communication beam and talk fighter to fighter. Uh, you know, you can use conformal arrays. So you get more coverage on the sides. Yeah, it's awesome. The downside, power and cooling. Mm -hmm. it takes a lot of power and a lot of cooling, and those are non-trivial. Those are not infinite assets in a fighter. What about, uh, and perhaps this is just a philosophical question around the, the cat and mouse nature of R&D development, fielding of capabilities, and then threat nations doing the same. But what about proliferation then of those systems uh, in threat nations? I mean, you take China as an example. You know, we know, I know anecdotally at least, that you know their DERF and jammers are fantastic. They've got a very strong uh, uh, emphasis doctrinally on electronic attack. Uh, what, what about them then? So ACE is great for the APG-82 and the striking, but what about in you know their fifth-gen stealth fighter, in their you know, J-31s, what, J-17s, or you know, the, the myriad of fighter types that they've got? It's always a battle, right? And the, the, it's always a trade-off. And a lot, of the problem that, a lot of the problem with jamming and you know, electronic protection, electronic attack, that constant battle is the knowledge of the enemy systems. So it used to be you could examine the waveform and get a good idea on what was going on behind the radar. Now that's all digital signal processing. So as much as the antennas, once you started having a digital signal processor on the back end, that's when it got, you were able to A, generate better jamming techniques, but B, you had better resistance to jamming and the effect of the unknown processing had a huge effect on whether or not you were gonna be successful. Hmm. Uh, and whether or not you were going to know you were being successful. So it's just one of those things. Technology moves on, uh, but they are offsetting technologies. This is not, by the way, I don't believe in game-changing technologies. That's another discussion. Um, but the, uh, uh, you know, you constantly have your move-counter-move, and that hasn't changed with radars. It's move-counter-move. Okay. Okay. We've got time, I think, for two more, um, and that'll take us to the top of the hour, and we'll we'll call it a day there. So Nick P said, "I don't know, I don't know anything about this. I've, I've heard of it, but I don't know if you are in a position to comment more. But uh, what are your thoughts on the AMRAM replacement, um, potentially the AIM one twenty JTAM or JATAM? Uh, do you know anything uh, about that?" So thanks, thanks, Nick. Um, that's probably my nephew um, for feeding me a question where I'm completely unprepared to answer it. Is I have no idea, dude. Uh, uh, it's a it's a PowerPoint presentation. I do know that AMRAM ER, extended range AMRAM, is a thing. I know that even within the old AMRAM airframe, there have been steady improvements um, to the, the flight profile, the rocket motor, et cetera, that improve its range. Uh, and when I think the big 
thing is going to be when we start putting scramjets uh, on when we have a, a good solid or liquid fuel scramjet technology to add that to the missiles. Um, it's going to be neat, but there's also a manufacturer, and I won't name them, even though I don't own stock in them, who has uh, a, is actually being funded by the Air Force to develop a modular missile, whereby everything is a module. So if you want a different seeker, you put a different seeker on it. If you want an extended range package, you put the other rocket motor. Um, you want a different warhead, you put the different warhead. So I think that the AMRAM is the last of the old AIM-7 style air-to-air -air missiles and from now on we're going to move into the buck rogers realm where we're using technology that is developed that was developed for space flight or out of hypersonic research along with you know new microelectronics and and sensor methodologies that are going to make those things more lethal uh better range possibly more maneuverable although maneuverability is you know kind of controlled by your thrust vectoring and your fins Right. Um, and the altitude and all the other factors. So that may not be a huge change, but it could be um, depending on what your modules, what capabilities your module has. Can you have a air to air missile that moves sideways in the end game because it's got a, a motor pointing in one direction off to the side and you roll to point that motor away from the direction you want to go and you kick a boost sideways. There's a lot of things that can happen with air to air missiles. I think we're going to see some some fairly cool stuff developed. Okay, so we're going to do the final question, but before we do that, because everyone will drop off quite quickly, I just wanted to say thank you, everybody, for joining. I am hopeful that you will come back and join us again next month when we're going to do the same thing. Let us know what you think of the format of this. Um, you know, there's a risk it feels a bit bitty because we go about go between talking about Ukraine to talking about general topics, to talking back about Ukraine and all things relative to Ukraine again. So let us know if the format works for you and we'll keep it the same. And if it doesn't, then let us know what changes you'd like to see and we'll take those under consideration. So with that said, final question then, and they have started to really come in, but I'm just going to go with the um, question in order, which came from Single Sprocket which was, what do you think of this silver F-22? Um, it's a chameleonic smart skin. Is it a chameleonic? Chameleonic? There you go. Chameleonic. Is it, is it chameleonic uh, smart skin, or is it an unpainted F-22? You've seen the pictures of this this thing? There's an F-35 that's painted similarly or finished similarly. I, I read... Yeah, I've seen the pictures. I, 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 It's a neat finish. I mean, it looks great. <laughs> um, I don't know what it does or what it's for. Um you know, and a an adjustable skin, uh, in terms of, uh, you can actually get paint now, um, which changes its color based on electrical current going through it. Uh, you can paint your car that way. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm looking forward to somebody putting on an airplane so you can change the registration numbers. So if you're overflying somebody's house at low altitude and you don't want to know who you are, <laughs> you just power up the electric paint and change your registration numbers. Um, I feel like I've let something out of Pandora's container there, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, so I don't know anything about what it's for, but I think that if you, the, the color changing fabrics are also a thing mm -hmm. and the possibility to have a color changing surface um, might allow you to reduce your visual detectability, um, which might be handy for the, the within visual range fight, or it might be able to f have a better job of fooling the human eyes to whether a guy's turning into you or turning away. There's some interesting applications for that. But that's not the last question, because I saw a question that I wanted you to ask, and it wasn't asked, and so I'm going to have to ask it. It's the ask. It's the question about regions of the U.S. What? Okay, so this was a question where somebody asked it, and I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was. If you it, 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 remember, we had a discussion on Discord about how, for example, in Saudi Arabia, um, the pilots are all princes. There are a lot of princes in Saudi Arabia. Oh, yes, yeah. And that from the 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 higher level uh, stratus you were in the social pecking order had an influence on what aircraft you were assigned to. So the highest levels, of course, go to the F-15 Eagle and, you know, guys who aren't there fly the, the F-3 Tornado. Um, I don't know how it breaks out since that time frame. I mean, this is old Desert Storm era stuff. And he said, well, or she, well, you know, if you were to go use the Saudi method, okay, weasel pilots, weasel EWOs, which parts of the country would you, or what ethnic groups or whatever, what states would you pick? What parts of the country would you pick for pilots and EWOs? 
Ewo's Puerto Rico. And the reason I would pick Puerto Rico, if you're if you're not familiar with how Puerto Rico's Puerto Ricans speak, is that they're very fast, they're and they're bilingual. So the fact is that a couple of Puerto Rican Ewos can exchange data <laughs> at a high data rate quicker than anybody else with limited radio time, and they can essentially do it in code. So that's for the Ewos. For the pilots, I wanted a Southern California surfer dude. And the reason this came through is because I, I went through nav training and lead in fighter training with John Palmieri, who was a Southern California surfer dude. And I remember him as he passed out in the centrifuge at high G. <laughs> okay. As he was coming to, he finally, you know, comes up and he looks at the camera and he goes, Hey man, I was in Malibu. <laughs> And I want somebody who is always going to try to arrange to be close to a beach with good waves on any cross-country TDY or deployment. So there we go. Puerto Rico for the EWOs, Malibu for the pilots. Plus, they, you know, a little bit laid back. <laughs> Listen, um, to everybody at home who's tuned in or who's bunked off work, pretended to work, or has spent their evening um, joining us, thank you very much for that. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, I can't stress enough the importance of you coming to Discord, joining us, and putting questions for the next AMA, and even interacting with Star Baby in the meantime. I'm sure he would do that. And as I said, we've got uh, Shari Zeb, we've got Pyro 111, we've got Spectre Pilot, we've got um, a bunch of subject matter experts who will answer your questions and engage with you on all sensible questions the non-sensible ones they won't you'll be ridiculed for those. So thanks for joining us. Um, again, if you would like to uh, like and share this with anybody you think is interesting, then please, uh, interested in this kind of content, then please do. And I look forward to seeing you again, Star Baby, in a month or so's time. Are you going to join us again? Um, I hope to. Let's see. Yes, yes. And I will even wear a silly hat. I promised to wear a silly hat this time, at least for the opening. But I could not find my purple Halloween spider hat that my mom gave me when I was in college. Um, so you'll just have to think virtual purple spider hat with eyes. And I'll come up with a real hat for November because I got one in the lineup. Fantastic. We're looking forward to it. See you soon. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See you. Cheers.